hope today genuinely will be the last. Uh, hope today will genuinely be the last um, share on this topic of bechira uh, and free will. Um, and we were we were up to the the, very, the the topic that everyone talks about when they talk about bechira, which is yediyah and bechira, the contradiction between uh, Hashem's foreknowledge and uh, free will. And um, um, this was this was as I said, we worked through a lot of a lot of extra information, and this is where we were up to. Um, the the problem or the contradiction with Yeti and Vichira is often understood to be one of um, of uh, it's often dealt with on a, on a sort of on a single level. As we discussed last time, uh, one one could resolve it in in uh, two other methods than uh, the, the famous one that we're we're going to look at now. One is to question whether Hashem's knowledge of every detail, which, as I said, is uh, is not in line with the thinking of 99% of 99.99% of our Masora. There's one one figure that maybe suggests this. Um, and the second quest, the second option is to suggest there's no lack in Hashem's knowledge of what we are going to choose because it doesn't yet exist. Until we choose it, it hasn't yet occurred, and it's only when we choose it that there's a problem with uh, that. Only when we choose it is it there in existence. At which point it's knowable. In other words, it's no lack in God's um, absolute knowledge uh, to say he doesn't know something which isn't. He only knows that which that which is, not that which isn't. And therefore, there's no lack in his knowledge and not knowing what we are going to choose. And uh, the problem with this, surprisingly, isn't that philosophically this is this doesn't make sense, but that it would involve change in Hashem. And uh, there are members of the view that uh, change in Hashem is impossible. And therefore, it can't be that through our choice, he then comes to know. So the Ramam, uh, which we quoted last week, says that because Hashem's Yediyah is one with him, not something separate from him, it's not a quality about him, because the Ramam understands that the unity, the achtas of Hashem, means that we can't talk about qualities of Hashem. Any adjective used to describe Hashem is limiting. So even something that we think is innocuous, like saying Hashem is kind, is limiting because it defines him. And therefore, if Hashem is infinite, uh, no definition can be given. Or to put it differently, if we say he's kind, then it means that's his, that's his way of being, that's his attribute, that's his quality of personality, in which case he's not choosing to be kind. He's just doing this because that's the algorithm, the formula that programs how he operates. And again, that's limiting. So there are members of the view that we can't say any descriptions of Hashem, even uh, ones that we're used to saying, like Rachum and Hanan and the like, and all of them, we mean uh, what's what's labeled the via negativa, the negative theology. There are um, um, all of them are, are non uh, de definitions. What they all mean is who says something very similar? Sorry, yeah. yes. You can say the adjective, but that's not So, were it, were it not for the Rambam, there's two Mamori Chazal that were it not for the Rambam, we would understand differently or, or not realize. The, the Rambam is always basing himself on the Gemara, he's, he's always bringing out from the Medrash or from the Gemara something different to what we would take as obvious. So, so in that Gemara, we would think it simply means that uh, all, what we've said is the sum totality of the praises that are to be said about Hashem, and there's much more to say. We wouldn't realize it was dealing with a problem of infinity. And uh, the other Gemara about al Kansipa, that Gemara again, were not for the Ramam. We would take it as just, uh, it's, if Hashem created bird suffering, then, then it doesn't make sense to say the mitzvahs about non-suffering and so on. We wouldn't, we wouldn't hear the full implication. But yeah, the other Ramam understands that this is making us think about the problem of infinity, and uh, um, you can't give a definition to any to to absolute infinity, um, it's the only thing you can say is non-definition. So even infinity, as we said last time, is a non-word, non-finite, um, ain soif. But you can't give a uh, a positive definition to it because that would be trying to to circumscribe, trying to limit, trying to delineate, and all descriptions involve delineation. So Ramam is, is starting with his uh, with with this idea that he discusses extensively in his uh, in his Moria and Mochim in particular in his guide. And um, here he, he mentions this briefly in his Mishnah Torah, and he says that uh, even when we talk about Hashem's Yediyah, his knowledge, we have this problem, because it is, in a sense, there's two ways of saying the same problem. One way of saying it is that saying if we say Hashem knows something, we're delineating him, we're saying something definitional about him, we're saying he exists in this state, but not in that state. He knows, but he doesn't not know. So that this is a, uh, a delineation. He's in this condition, but not in that condition, and that's a, uh, a limitation. The other way you can formulate this is that the 
Rambam thinks that uh, um, any um, any categorization or class that we give to Hashem is is a contradiction to his infinity. So there's two reasons, if you like, why this table, or sorry, it's a contradiction to his unity, forgive me. There's two reasons if, um, why this table is, uh, is, uh, is not, in, why this table lacks unity. The first is because um, physically it has components. So it has a, a table top and it has legs and parts. And as soon as you have parts, you don't have a complete unity. You could separate it into pieces. Indeed, even if it only consisted of a tabletop, you could separate it into pieces. So it has this part over here and that part over there, which is a contradiction to the unity of the table. So this is the first point that the Rambam makes, that Hashem can't have parts. Indeed, he can't have limits, because as soon as you have limits, you have an edge and you have a core, and therefore that would contradict Hashem's unity. And um, he must be above time and space, because otherwise that would also contradict his unity, because as soon as something exists, Spatially, then it has a part over here and a part over there, which is again a contradiction to unity. And the second point that Rama makes is that conceptually, this table lacks unity because it is because there's a number of descriptions that you can say about it. It is a table, but it's also part of a class of objects called furniture. So it's part of a class of furniture. So it has multiple descriptions. It's also part of a class of material things. So it has at least three, it's also part of the class of wooden things and so on and so forth. So it has a number of, of layers to its description. So the same as physically it has parts, it has a tabletop and it has legs. Also just in terms of description, it has uh, parts because it's a material object, it's part of the class of material objects, it's part of the class of wooden objects, it's part of the class of furniture and so on and so forth. And then again, the Ramam therefore elaborates that any description that we would give would make, would mean there's commonality between Hashem and uh, other objects, which would be a, a type of conceptual uh, uh, peacemaking or part, part separation into parts or components that we can talk about Hashem. So Hashem is neither physically nor conceptually uh, breakable, neither physically nor conceptually uh, consisting of components or past parts. And therefore, both because of the unity of Hashem and because of his infinity, we can't say any descriptions about him. So, so goes the thought of Ramam. And Ramam thinks that his unity and his his in, his inf, infinity are really one and the same concept. They emerge from uh, emerge from each other. So this is the a general uh, sort of summary of the view of the Ramam around, around these matters. And the Ramam therefore simply applies this to the problem of Yudia and Bechira. And he says, since his Yudia is not like our Yudia, because our Yudia is separate from our unity, we can say that Zobin knows something. And there's neither a problem of infinity or unity because I'm neither infinite nor, nor a unit, nor, nor solely one. I'm a member of a class. I'm part of the class of human beings and, and um, therefore I'm not conceptually uh, complete unity either. So when I know something, my idea, my knowledge is separate from my essence. Um, it's an adjective. I'm in a state of knowing something or a verb. When we speak about Hashem, when we say he knows something, we are only using, we are only using borrowed language. Because in truth, um, he and his knowledge are not separate in any way, and therefore they both have the limits of human description, and therefore there's nothing we can say about his yadiyah, and therefore, says the Ramam, the idea that his yadiyah contradicts Bechira is, is, is not a good philosophical question. Our yadiyah contradicts Bechira because th there's a word called yadiyah. We can say about ourselves, we can say Zobin knows something. We can't ultimately say Hashem knows anything. He doesn't, what the most we can say is he doesn't not know. We can't say he knows because this is simply using human language around a, a, a being of, of unity and infinity about whom we can say nothing. Even when we say he's a being, that uh, implies a lack of unity because we're saying he's part of the class of things that are. We can't even say Hashem exists technically. What we can say is he doesn't not exist. He more than exists. He, he infinitely exists, which is another way of saying he more than exists, but we can't delineate and speak about his existence. So the Ramam says this solves the problem of Yadiyah and Bechira um, because there's a breakdown in human language when we speak about Hashem and therefore the problem evaporates. The Ravid, as we saw last week, uh, says basically what you've said is a long-winded I don't know. If you're going to say I don't know, then just say you don't know why raise questions that you're not going to be able to answer. And then the Ravid gives his own suggested answer, which we again discussed last week. Um, and, and the rival says, uh, uh, the rival concludes it comes in a shove or holds in a shove. Even this answer doesn't really resolve the, the issue. The Rambam, who, who is happy with this type of I don't know, thinks that I don't knows aren't problems when we have a good reason why we don't know. In other words, in, in all fields of human endeavor, 
there are there are we come up with theories or explanations or narratives which we recognize are, are, are limited and there's parts of the story or the narrative or the explanation that we don't know and we don't throw out every scientific theory just because we recognize there's some holes or limitations in it we carry on pursuing it and trying to plug the holes and then we come up with another sort of question at that point we say look we have, we have to tear this up clearly something has gone wrong in other words, there are certain types of I don't knows where we recognize that we're either were we to continue and pursue it, we would find an answer, or there's a good reason why we have arrived at I don't know. There's, there's not a problem in our lack of knowledge. Whereas other types of lack of knowledge, we recognize there's a flaw in the theory. Something's gone wrong with everything we're saying if we're unable to resolve this issue. And I'm of the view, and, the, and this is what he really elaborates again on in Zmora, that as soon as you get to a problem that grapples with, it, with, as soon as you get to a question or something that you don't know, and it's connected with the problem of infinity, the breakdown of human language, that's not the sort of I don't know that should throw you, because there's very good reasons that we understand why, why we can't talk about these things. We understand that human vocabulary is limited. I don't just mean human vocabulary in, choice, in terms of the dictionary words that we have, because then we could invent another word to deal with it. I mean, our very ability to reason is, is, is achieved through delineating, through circumscribing, through uh, outlining the edges, our ability to see something is as much of as where the object is as about where the object isn't. We can only perceive objects through their edges. And similarly, we can only conceive of concepts through their edges, through their boundaries. If a concept becomes infinite, there's nothing, for, nowhere for us to grasp it, either tangibly, physically, or conceptually. Um, there's no word for it. If the, if the reason this is a table is because it's not a chair. If it's a table and a chair and everything else, there's no word for it. There's a breakdown in language. And that's the Rambam isn't bothered by this uh, concept of uh, this question of Yudhiya and Bechira, because as Yudhiya was only ever at best a borrowed word. It's not my problem that you are a messy philosophical thinker and that you didn't understand what we meant by talking about Hashem's Yudhiya. What you should have understood is what we mean is he doesn't not know. And as he, he, he more than knows or he's beyond knowing, rather than saying he does know. Um, the reason we talk about Hashem knowing is to indicate that he does not know. In other words, don't think he's limited by a lack of knowledge, but the knowledge that he has is, is above knowledge. And therefore there's a breakdown in the human language and, uh, um, and the philosophical question evaporates. So says the Raman. Now, I, I guess most of us are sitting here saying, we sort of hear this on a, on a vague level, but what's this, is there any, anything more tangible that we can say around this? And here you get to the famous um, Hashem being above time, type of answer, which is which is just one very limited way. The Raman, by the way, doesn't say this explicitly. Nowhere does he say that the answer is Hashem is above time. I, I, however, it's a, it's a useful tool for, for, um, for understanding why, if you're not careful about philosophical terminology, and if you picture Hashem's idea as our idea, it breaks apart. So the, the, the Raman really means Hashem is above everything. So he's above time, he's above space, he's above description. And therefore, on every level, when we think about the clash between Yudhiya and Bechira, the problem falls apart. Um, it happens to be that talking about him being above time is a, a relatively sort of graspable or, or understandable example of where definitions fall apart if, if, when, you're talk, when you're talking about infinity. So it's a useful uh, crowbar to crack open this problem and get a feel for what the Rama means. I don't think the Rama would disagree that that one example of why there is no clash between Yudhiya and Bechira when you're talking about infinity is because of being above time. I think it's simply he would say this is too limited because he's above everything. And therefore there's, there's an infinite number of answers why Yudhiya and Bechira don't clash because he's a, the Yudhiya of Hashem is above all definition. But, but if we unpick the contradiction between Yudhiya and Bechira, one part of the problem has to do with the problem of time. And therefore, if we can jump above time, if we can conceive of Hashem as being above time, then we can resolve, this is one example of where the equation falls apart of a contradiction between Yudhiya and Bechira. The truth is, if you think about it, even this part of the answer is in essence incomprehensible because we don't really know what above time means either. Um, we, we use terminology without thinking about it. We speak about Hashem as being beyond time and space, but, but we don't really know what, what, what the, that terminology means. Um, current science, by the way, has the same problem. In, in current science, we talk about an expanding universe, which is often pictured to mean that, the, you know, in, in, in year seven in high school, you're showing the balloon, which the balloon is expanding, and on the balloon are lots of dots, and the stars are rushing outwards. And uh, you, we picture that as the expanding universe. And uh, we are able to conceive it quite easily because the balloon exists in a very large room, the classroom, and the balloon is expanding into the classroom. And we picture the stars as expanding into space. Now, that um, is not at all what we mean by expanding the universe. What we mean is that space itself is expanding. At which point, one sort of, sort of begs the question, what's it expanding into? And the answer is it's not expanding into anything. There is no anything because there's no space beyond it. 
Um, and, and then you want to say, so what's outside that space? And the answer is vocabulary has broken down. There is no outside the space because outside means the space outside something and there is no space there. So, so current science has, has arrived at the same problem with space and with time. Again, we talk about the, the Big Bang or the moment of the, the singularity, which time comes into existence. And again, you're tempted to say what happened before the Big Bang, right? What, what, uh, what took place before that moment? And the answer is the same way as there's no outside space. Before also is a temporal concept. There is no before the start of time because there is no before. So science has arrived in, in this sense at a, a picture that's very similar to, to what we Jews have been uh, arguing for for at least three and a half thousand years, which is uh, that uh, time and space came into existence at a particular uh, point in time and space. Again, they break down the vocabulary. As a sort of, we, we, have, we have a problem, yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we don't really know how to express this. And, and this is really the point that the Raman is making. So, so science doesn't throw out the theory of a singularity because of these philosophical problems, because it understands that that's inherent in the theory is that there's a breakdown in human vocabulary. And it's the same philosophically speaking um, that in the point the Raman's making in, in uh, Yudhiya. So again, yes. Yeah. Very existent of these concepts, which are sort of by definition beyond our grasp. Yes. Which the whole of the. Yes. Which the whole of the. Yes. 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 So, so like a lot of, uh, as I said before, like a lot of the Midrashim that, that were not for the Ramam, we might read the Midrash one way or might not even have perceived the depth that lay in the, in the Midrash. And the Ramam in his introduction to Mo and many other places says uh, um, that in Midrashim carry within them. Ramam speaks extensively about the concept of a moshal, an analogy. And he says Midrashim should be understood as an analogy. He quotes the Pasuk that they should be seen as, as tapuchizov, they should be seen as, as um, a, you know, a gold, a drop of gold that can be found in, in, a, in a shell of clay. And uh, Ramam says that all Midrashim have to be understood as teaching us uh, deep truths, often philosophical truths. So Ram takes series of chazals that speak about the limitation of uh, our ability to praise Hashem. So this is one of the that the Ramam quotes. Now we could have said, or um, the the the, um, the Gemara that um, you can't put based on a drosh of a posuk, zeshmi and so on, that you can't pronounce the name of Hashem. Now were it not for the Ramam, we might have understood this as some idea of respect for Hashem. You can't say the name of Hashem because we should show covered. Lo yirani adam b'chai. Don't you, no human can see me and live. We would think uh, we could think means uh, because Hashem is so massive that we're unable to see him, or so his, his sun is so bright that we can't gaze at it. And this is indeed the Medrash, right? The Medrash says, I think it was one, one of the uh, maybe Tornus Rufus, one one of the uh, sort of uh, challenges of Chazal, uh, a min. No, it's a min. It's a gemara. It was a min that said to Hashem, "Show me Hashem." And he said, "Look at the sun. You can't look at the sun, and you're blinded. So how on earth do you expect to be able to look at uh, at Hashem and and see him?" So all of these ideas we could have understood to mean that Hashem is so magnificent, so bright, so powerful that we can't see him and live. We can't. Uh, see them. The Ramam reveals to us to understand this as a philosophical truth that, that our minds are incapable of grasping. It doesn't just happen to be that Hashem is so bright that we can't uh, we, we, we can't see him, but uh, he's, he's fundamentally not perceivable because of these philosophical challenges. So the Ramam, uh, Ramam arrives at this, at his unique blend of philosophical reasoning, because he thinks philosophically it doesn't make sense to talk about uh, seeing or perceiving or conceiving of God, and he understands this into the thought of Chazal. Um, is this what Chazal meant or not? But that's that's the whole that's the Machlokes we're showing. I mean, that, it, those that disagreed with the Ramam thought that the Ramam either was wrong philosophically, or at least trying to make Chazal into philosophers when they were trying to say other ideas. But uh, in this respect, I think the Ramam is is near universally seen as having won the argument, and and therefore we 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 read Chazal now through the lens of the uh, through the lens of the Ramam in these aspects. The, the Mona Vachim uh, uh, is no secret to anyone uh, led to the rise of lots of debate. Um, in some areas, the Ramam won and shut down the conversation. And ever since the Ramam, we, we've almost not been able to think otherwise. And in other areas, um, the, the Ramam didn't win the, the debate. In this particular area, the, the, the constant warning of the Ramam about care when we talk about the middles of HaKadosh Baruch, about what we really mean and uh, caution around speaking about infinity. I think in this respect, uh, the Ramam pretty conclusively uh, won the debate. And, and no one since the Ramam has, has seriously read these, uh, these Gemara's otherwise. <laughs> But we know historically that pre the Ramam, it wasn't obvious to read these chazals like this. And um, even nowadays, these, these chazals are sometimes taught in, in a way that doesn't bring out the philosophical uh, implication of them. 
Oh, oh, sorry, no, I'm, I'm simply saying that, yeah, so that's absolutely correct. The current scientific thinking um, around, it's, I mean, I think I've spoken about this before when we spoke about the age of the universe, but were you a, a Jew living in the year 1906, and you said that the universe was a finite age and size, um, in others came into existence at a finite uh, uh, point in time, um, you would be going against best scientific thinking for, for about 2,800 years. Because since the Greeks and Plato and Aristotle, they believe that the universe was infinitely old. And it's, it's very interesting because modern intuition is very, is very quite struggles with this belief. The Greeks really confronted this problem. And they said that if space came into existence at a particular time or space was of limited time, what would be outside it? What happened beforehand? And they didn't like this idea. And therefore they conceived of time and space as, as uh, going on infinitely, of, uh, as, as, as being of infinite uh, um, size. The Rambam speaks about this in the Mora, and the Rambam says, with all my respect I have for, um, for the Greeks and their thinking, in this particular area they have no evidence, it's just a claim, it's just what seems to them to be reasonable, and therefore we have no reason to question Boratius Baradokim, which states that time uh, came into existence. And both the Rambam and his Mora and uh, the Gaon in his reading of the uh, Agadotov of Basara Mamaris Nifra Elam understands that Boratius Bara, when the Gemara says Boratius Bara is af, Afhimaima, who is also a statement, it means that time comes into existence. I, I think I spoke about this last week, I mentioned last week, which, which is why I just briefly alluded to it now. And uh, to be a Jew meant that you were arguing with the cleanest, clearest, best Greek thought that had preceded you for about three, for, for about 2,800 years. Um, since, and I choose the year 1906 deliberately, because since 1906, Einstein's theory came along, expanding universe. Einstein himself famously questioned the conclude, that being the conclusion of his theory, um, that as of the 1960s, it has been, become very clear that we're living in an expanding universe, which according to current thinking, if you crunch backwards, if you move backwards, if you're living in an expanded universe, the universe which is expanding, where space itself is expanding, if you turn the clock back, it would, it would suggest that it rose from what's called a singularity, a point where science and the laws of science and indeed human vocabulary breaks down because time and space came into existence itself. So, so you're absolutely correct. This is a, a very recent uh, um, idea. Um, you know, we think that it's, you know, it, there's a lot of talk about uh, the 6,000 year date of, uh, of, of Boratius versus the current thinking of 13.8 billion and what one does with that. And I'm not going to go into that now, other than to say that the gap between 6,000 years and 13.8 is pretty small compared between to 6,000 years and infinite. Or to put it differently, um, the gap between 13.8 billion and infinite is a far greater gap than the gap between, in other words, fundamentally, at least as of 2023, we've won the core argument. It's a pretty good time to be a mammon. Um, meaning we live in a, in a universe in which the, the philosophical and scientific conclusion at the moment as things stand is that we indeed live in a universe in which space and time came into existence as a singularity and science can't say anything beyond that point in others by definition there has to be if if we are to conceive of a framework within which this occurs it has to be a non-material non-spatial um, uh, space within which it exists it can't, it, the framework within which it exists can't be something within time and space it has to be something where by definition there's a breakdown of science so so a scientist correctly will say what what preceded the singularity is non-scientific which may be because if he's not a good philosopher, he may mean it doesn't exist at all. But a philosopher would say what, what this framework within which the singularity occurred has to be some form of conceptual framework or something above time and space that, that within which the singularity can develop or something of the sorts. So, so thinking has certainly moved um, to closer to the concept of time and space existing within something beyond time and space. So in that sense, we're, we're in, in very good we're in very good shape. I'm, I'm always cautious around this because uh, tomorrow the theory changes, and and uh, you know we need to have the strength as as Marminim to do what the Rambam did and what every every Jew did till then, which is say if you have scientific proof against you, you do need to rethink. And the Rambam speaks about this in his Mona Vachim. But if you have scientific theory against you or, or arguments from a reasonableness and so on, then you don't need to rethink. And and for that we we, we rely absolutely on our uh, on our Masora. But, but all of this is, is taking us off uh, well, where I wanted to go, which is, uh, is simply saying that the Rambam points out to us that when we say that Hashem is above time and space, which he <laughs> believed um, because of philosophical theory and because of his reading of Mamari Chazal, his, his particular reading of, of Mamari Chazal, um, he says we can't really say anything about Yediyah and therefore we need not worry about the problem. 
The Raivad says on the Raman, so all your sets are glorious, I don't know. The Raman answers, yes, but there are, I don't know, which are, are philosophically great. There are, I don't know, which are problem, and the other ones, which when you understand that the philosophy, and there's a fundamental, I don't know, inherent in the philosophy, that's not the sort of I don't know you should worry about. What, what can we grab of this idea? How can we make this more, more palatable? How can we, we relate to this idea? So one of the most palatable ways of relating to it is by thinking about it being above time. What do we mean when we say it's about time? The, the core of the paradox of Yudhiya and Bechira is based on the assumption that my choice um, causes the knowledge. In other words, there's a, a causal chain in which effect follows cause. We, we, we live in a world in which the result or the effect always follows the cause, and therefore we have a problem over here. My choosing, if it's to be free, means it has to be a moment of innovation. My choice didn't exist previously. And therefore my choosing has to be the cause of God knowing, because he, he knows as a result of me choosing. In which case you get into the problem of God cha changing. If you want to avoid the problem of changing God, then you have to say God doesn't know. Either way, God didn't know what I chose, what I was going to choose before I chose, because effect follows cause. If we remove time, then, it, it, then effect and cause can be simultaneous, or, or we're above time, or even maybe within in in the temporal zone, maybe effect can precede cause. Who says effect always has to follow cause? In fact, there are readings of, I, I know very little about quantum mechanics, so I want to be very careful when I, I say this, but uh, um, the little bit of reading I've had is there are readings of quantum mechanics in which it's possible that effect can precede cause. So it's only because we, we, we don't really understand what's referred to as the arrow of time and the concept of cause and effect, that we have this problem in which we say that, that if knowledge of the result must be triggered by um, the, uh, must be triggered by the, the, uh, the, the choice itself, in other words, the result, the effect, has to follow after the choice. But if for a being who is above time, again, these are borrowed terminology, we don't really know what above time means, it's a meaningless, you know, we think, of, the reason we conceive of being above time is because we sort of picture it as analogies, you know, you have a piece of paper with an ant walking on it, and, and we're sort of looking down on it, and seeing it, but if for a few moments we can, we can conceive of above time, so above time Hashem can know it, even without contradicting our choice, because he's already, if you like, seen our choice, or to put it within time, we can say the effect, the result of knowing, can uh, can proceed the choice itself, and therefore the problem breaks down. So I just want to emphasize again, you, you'll often hear this answer, which is a, a, a reasonable answer as far as reason goes, which is since Hashem is above time, we need not be concerned with the problem of Yudhiya and Bechira. The whole problem, to put it in different ways, was that there are two ways of saying the problem, both of which depends on time. One way is by saying that our choice causes Hashem to know. Another way of saying it is if he knows in advance, then we don't have a choice. Because if I know in advance that you're going to choose A, then you can't be then you don't have an option to choose B, in which case you can't be described as being able to freely choose between A and B. If we conceive of Hashem as above time, both these variants of the problem fall apart, and therefore we don't have a question. The only quibble the Raman would have about all of this would be, you don't know what you're talking about because the phrase above time doesn't mean anything. And therefore he would say better if you want to be a true philosopher to phrase it in the way he's saying, which is we, we can't delineate Hashem's Yudhiya in any way at all. His Yudhiya is just a label we give but to a non-concept because Hashem is above any descriptions. And therefore the clash between Yudhiya and Bechira falls apart on, on, on infinite levels, not just on the temporal plane. But, but thinking about time is one easy way for us to sort of grab what the Rambam uh, means uh, uh, philosophically. So this is um, this brings to a conclusion the, the core part of, of what I want to say and what we've been discussing over the last few weeks in terms of some of the uh, philosophical problems with Yudhi and Bechira. If you remember, we, we started off, or, or some philosophical problems with Bechira rather, um, we started off by thinking about, uh, by, by mentioning that there's, there's many other problems with it. We don't really understand where free will comes from, the paradox, if free will is genuinely chosen at this moment in time. Does it have a cause that precedes it or not? If it has a cause that precedes it, then it's not free. If it doesn't have a cause that precedes it, then it's what we would call random. We spoke of other theological problems, including the idea of Hashem's uh, all control, Hashkacha, and whether that contradicts Bechira. And finally, we arrived at the paradox of Yadir and uh, Bechira and uh, uh, foreknowledge. We spoke about destiny and uh, the Arachayim, um, but this is the, the conclusion in terms of the famous contradictions. <laughs> Uh, Chaim is the, is, has become the most famous source for, for uh, what's really uh, discussed by other thinkers, the Zohan and seven others, but the, uh, um, the, the idea that the brothers chose to throw Yosef into the pit um, rather than directly killing him, because were they to kill him, it's possible they could kill him despite his life plan being otherwise. Whereas if they throw him to the pit, they're leaving him to the, the chances of nature, and therefore it's possible to overcome. We discussed to what degree can my Bechir influence someone else, 
and uh, the, the paradox that we get to, which is if my Bechira can't influence and it can't affect anyone else, then it doesn't seem to be a meaningful choice. There doesn't seem to be a, a moral reason why I can't take out a gun and shoot someone. And the Bani Musa taught us to answer a lot and be, yeah, but then you're the murderer, you've done something wrong. He said that doesn't seem to make sense because a, a moral choice is choosing between a moral option and an immoral option. If either way the person is going to die, my choice is, doesn't seem to have any moral content. Um, all the alternative is I can indeed affect someone else, which is very troubling, that my choices can impact your life. And we discussed with Desper's model and the sense model, that indeed in some particular and unique way, my choice can affect other people, even, even though it's, it's, it's a little uncomfortable. Um, the, the final uh, thing I sort of want to talk about is, um, is just to, I, I promised I'd use the last few minutes available, to talk a little bit about the Marmori Chazal um, around muzzle and bashet and, and other such terms that one often sees. So this is moving really from the realm of uh, philosophy just towards the realm of uh, uh, Medrash and Agoda. And um, there, are, there are numerous um, Medrashim and Agadotas that discuss the issue of uh, predestination and fate and the like. Um, for simplicity's sake, I'm going, to mer- I'm going to merge all of them. Um, very briefly, the, the, the Greeks had a concept of fate and told many stories about things which were predicted and um, humans scrabble around trying to avoid uh, their fate. And nonetheless, uh, whatever they do, they end up either it happening or it being the very cause of it happening. Um, there are a few uh, medrashim that, that are sort of in similar line, except they don't mean fate as in some form of abstract concept or, or some form of pagan idea, but they mean you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu's, uh, vision um, for the world, and uh, there's, there's a number of them. There's a a, a medrash that um, talks about uh, Shlomo HaMelech, who, who um, was told that he was going to have a, a, a daughter that was going to marry a very simple person, and he didn't want that. And in order to stop it, he locks her in a tower and imprisons her. And of course, she gets frustrated by the imprisonment and uh, um, builds a ladder and escapes. And that's the very cause of. Uh, her ending up meeting this uh, simple person rather than marrying a prince that was appropriate for her class. The, the, the Madrashim that's sort of uh, similar to this, but Chazal addressed this topic in in uh, in the context of Ashkacha of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. That's one area where it's addressed, and the other area it's addressed is in the context of of uh, of, of muzzle. Um, the, the exact meaning of muzzle isn't entirely clear. Um, one understanding of it is its meaning as the zodiac to do with the influence of the stars. And uh, gets us into the topic of, of astrology and to what degree stars have an influence on our lives. But in, in, it, let's evade all of that and, and put that on the side. And from our point of view, talk about it as some, some determinism. So nowadays, in modern terms, we would say, to what degree are the decisions I make predetermined by biology, by my DNA, by, by nurture and nature and things like that. But w- w- whatever the external influences, to what degree are things that I'm going to go through in life predetermined because of, my, uh, because of forces beyond myself? And to what degree are they uh, are they within my my choice and my ability to to affect? So so whether we call these forces beyond ourselves muzzle, as in uh, um, uh, astrological influence, or whether we just call it uh, uh, DNA and, and uh, genetic predispositions, so on to what degree does it is it influence? So there's a number of uh, chazals around this, and I'll I'll just mention some of them. Um, there is a uh, a Gemara Nidor that says Kol everything is in the hands of the heaven. Chutz meyers. Uh, um, Shemayim. In other words, everything is in the hands of heaven besides Yer Shemayim. It's really a posuk. What does Hashem demand of you? And so on. But to fear me. So uh, um, Rashi, I think, spells out. He says, Everything is in the hands of heaven. He says, in other words, where the person is tall or short or rich or poor, um, whether they're wise or a, a fool, whether their skin complexion is, is light or dark. None of this is in their hands. In other words, all our uh, um, properties of existence are, are beyond our control. Um, so now we'd say these are all genetically uh, controlled, whether it's all or short or, or the like. This is in in uh, this is uh, Shemaim, This is in the hands of uh, um, of of uh, of Hu. Baruch um, There's another Gemara that says a kol Shemaim, chutz with sin and opachin. Everything is in the hands of uh, um, of uh, human being of of Shemaim, other than uh, colds and flus. In other words, the Gemara is saying um, if you get a cold or a flu, um, it's your silly fault. Um, put on a scarf or uh, take more vitamin supplements or whatever it is that you think will help. Um, 
these things are bidet are dominant, but other things, including health things, which are beyond our capacity uh, to control, are bidet, uh, bidet shemaim. The Gemara, by the way, Nidor carries on, and maybe I should have mentioned this, it says there's a, there's a malach who's mumuna al heroyan. There's a, some uh, divine agency that's in charge of, of conception, and no till tip, it takes a, a drop, in other words, the, the moments of conception, the drop of sperm, and, uh, um, and uh, the moments of conception, or a if now who takes it to run to Hashem, the Omer of Hanavan says, to Hashem, Rabboni Shalom, master of the universe, tip of Zumata Heoleo, what will be the fate of this uh, drop as it grows into uh, uh, form, into human view? Gibber or Cholosh, will it be strong or weak? Tip of Chacham, Asher Oni, um, etc. So will this figure be uh, weak or strong? Will it be rich or poor? And will Russia or Tzaddik go to Amr? But it doesn't say Russia and Tzaddik. In other words, um, the, 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 everything is in the hands of Hashem. The external situation that we have is in the hands of uh, Hashem. And the internal uh, um, way we react, the choices that we make to deal with this external situation, that's in our hands. So we can't control our external abilities or resources. We can choose how we respond to them, whether we choose to respond in, in a better or uh, or worse, um, worse way. The Gemara on Shabbos that um, brings Machlokas about this. Rav Hanina says, "Mazal Machkim, Mazal Ma'ashe, Vyesh Mazal Yisrael." The Mazalos control whether the person is wise or foolish, whether the person is rich or poor, and there is Mazal Yisrael. In other words, we human beings also exist in the realm of Mazal, or in uh, modern day terminology, we would say we also have genetics. Right? We also um, our our uh, our life path is, is is determined to some degree. Rabbi Yochanan Omer, Ein Mazel Yisrael, and this, this is how we paskin, Ein Mazel Yisrael, there's no Mazel uh, Yisrael, um, and it, it, the Gemara then brings that Rabbi Yochanan was Doishis from the, the story in the Brisbane of Sorum, in which Hashem said, uh, um, uh, which, it, it, sorry, the Gemara then brings Rav, who says, that this is in the Brisbane of Sorum, in the story of the Brisbane of Sorum, Hashem said to Avram, um, say a chutzah, go outside, which Chafal understands to mean, go beyond the stars, Ein Mazel Yisrael, you exist beyond the astrological um, inferences. Um, then you have a Gemara mode. Cotton, Benei, Chaya, Benei, and Mazone, a person's life, uh, children, and Mazone, their, their sustenance, their panasa, their livelihoods. Tuluyim um, Bamazel, or dependent on Mazel. Um, the Zoya says, Hakol Tali Bamazel, very famous quote from the Zoya, Hakol Tali Bamazel, I feel you say for Torah Shemahechel. Um, the, everything is Torah Mazel, even the Sefer Torah in the Shul, in other words, which Sefer Torah, one way of understanding this is which Sefer Torah gets used, right? That we, we have uh, many Sefer Torah in the Shul, some get used a lot, some don't get used as much, even that is Tali Bamazel, Afidu Sefer Torah, Shema Eichel, it's often often referred to Tami the Chomim and and their fate in life, in other words, even the Talmud Chacham, their, their success in life is dependent on Mazel, um, and, and so it goes on. There's, there's also possible Isurim around this, the, the Pasuk says, one should go perfectly or simply in their belief of Hashem, which the Gemara is Dorish to mean that one shouldn't, uh, one shouldn't consult the uh, Chaldeans, the, uh, the, um, the, Kald- the Chaldean, the, the astrologers of the time. And um, there's two ways, again, to understand this Pasuk. One explanation of this Pasuk is don't consult the astrologers um, because astrology is worthless, at least for Jews. And the alternative reading of this pasuk is um, it has an effect on life, but don't consult them because it's not your role to, to sort of get into predicting the future. Just stay Tomim Tiyam Hashem Rekecha. Just trust Hashem. Um, again, in modern terminology, if it's the latter, we would have a little bit of difficulty understanding it precisely. If astrology does have an effect on people, and it's just a, a, a natural phenomena that somehow out of the alignment of the stars has an effect on your life, then what it's really saying is don't use scientific predictive modeling. In which case, it's difficult to understand why you uh, why you can't consult um, a weather forecaster or economic forecast. I mean, there may be other reasons why you don't want to rely on either weather forecasters or economic forecasters. But if if it's if it simply means scientific modelling, it's a little bit difficult to understand what's unique about astrology. If it, if it's indeed part of the sort of scientific fabric of the universe that the stars have an effect on on, on human fate, then why why, why is this a steer to Tom and Tia? Surely this is a sensible hishtadlus. Whereas if we understand, like the Rambam, for example, did, that what it's really saying is that muzzle is meaningless, or at least a muzzle is strong, then we understand why not to consult them. Go with Hashem, because you have a direct relationship with Hashem. Don't worry about all these uh, predictive models. They're not, uh, they're not, they're, they're not uh, determinative. There's no, there's no predetermination of fate. The Gemara brings the story of the, the daughter of Abikiva, um, 
who was meant to be astrologically was uh, um, predicted that she was going to die of a snake bite at her own wedding, and she fed an oni at her wedding, she fed a full person, and in the course of that happened uh, coincidentally to put her pin into the pin the snake to the wall, and as a result uh, didn't die from the, the snake was killed and didn't or at least disabled and didn't die from the the snake bite. In other scenes, indicate that the deeds that we do can affect uh, even overcome uh, muzzle. So, so where do we, uh, then, then there's the Gemara, I should have mentioned, the famous Gemara in Sota, at the beginning of Sota, the Gemara discusses the, uh, the concept of a, a zivug, that abayim yom kodem yitzir savlad, 40 days before the formation of a child, um, a, a baskel comes out and says, baskeloni leploni, that this person is predetermined to marry someone else. In other words, even marriage, our, our life partners is predetermined in advance of our lives. And you could hear a logic to that. Since life partners have such a, a closely interwoven life mission, surely there has to be something that's predetermined. Even if I make silly decisions, why should my spouse suffer and not have a life partner? And if you could sort of hear why, why even that would be included in this. On the other hand, the Gemara then carries on and, and uh, the Gemara asks a steer a contradiction from this, in which it says that a zivug is told on, on, on one's deeds. And there was something called zivug rishon and zivug sheni, which, uh, which is not entirely clear what it means. A first match and a second match, perhaps meaning the ideal life partner and the non-ideal life partner. And other people have a predetermined ideal life partner, but the decisions can affect that, in which case they'll get a second option. So, so this, this remains an enormous uh, tangle of, of, uh, um, of uh, concepts. Um, I don't want to particularly, uh, I'll mention two points, and with this we'll, we'll conclude. Um, one is, in essence, the, the famous view of the Rambam around astrology isn't, isn't at heart that relevant to all of this, um, because it, it doesn't remove the philosophical problem, it just, it just has to do with the scientific truth or otherwise of astrology. The Rambam in his famous letter to uh, Chachme Montpellier speaks about the stewards and the contradictions in the Gemara around the idea of astrology, and he basically says, that, um, the, it, or it goes the other way around. The Rambam wrote that he doesn't believe in astrology at all. The Chachmim Pelia challenged him and said, but surely you find that Chazal are full of astrology. And the Rambam basically gives uh, um, a couple of answers to this. First thing is he said, you don't find that Chazal are full of astrology. You find that some of Chazal believed in astrology, but many, and I think most, didn't. And therefore, like any other area of life, we, we, we are entitled to follow the majority and we don't need to be concerned about the minority. It's true that some of Chazal believed in astrology, but this is not an ikka, this is not a fundamental faith. This is not something that, um, that, that has clear Torah sources and therefore we're entitled to follow, like in any other Mahalokas, I'm entitled to Paskin and follow the majority of the first thing the Raman says. The second thing the Raman says is, um, this isn't a matter of Torah. This is a matter of uh, science and philosophy. And therefore, we're entitled to progress and, and, uh, and move on. And therefore, even if they did believe in it, they, that, that was, that was in, in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in a sense in secular knowledge or in philosophical and scientific knowledge. And things move forward in the sciences. And we don't need to worry about their belief. This, this removes, in a sense, the, the terminology of muzzle and astrological uh, aspect of it. But the core philosophical problem, which is to what degree are things predetermined, it doesn't, it doesn't really uh, comment on. And it also doesn't comment on things which are, which are nothing to do with astrology. The Gemara that talks the bus call, the heavenly voice coming out, a, a decision by Kodesh Baruch that this person should be rich and this person should be uh, poor. So the only, um, to the best of my knowledge, and I may be wrong, the only consistent uh, figure that addresses this is yet again Radesla, who um, collates many of these sources in, in, a, in, a, uh, in an essay, in one of the essays that he wrote. Um, and and he, he says the following, which I think is very intuitive. He says some things are determined and other things aren't determined. Some things we have control over and other things we don't have control over. Some things can be tweaked somewhat by our behavior and other things can't be tweaked by our behavior. So in modern day language, we would say as follows, um, height, is height genetically determined or not? We know that to some degree it absolutely is. On the other hand, if someone is very malnourished, um, then they won't go to their maximum height. Whereas if someone is, is uh, well nourished, they will go to their full potential uh, biological height and, and so on and so forth. So things, some things are pretty determined, some things aren't predetermined, and um, however one understands it, whether one's talking about muzzle, whether muzzle indeed means astrological signs or means something else, um, the, some things are determined by muzzle, others aren't. He also argues that um, really the word muzzle um, is, is, is a, a, there are words that unfortunately are used in, in many contexts and don't always mean the same thing. Um, I spoke uh, a while back about minhag, and, and the problem is minhag means all sorts of different things. And it's very hard when someone says it's a minhag or Allah to know what to do. So Tessa says a muzzle also is, is his muzzle is, is simply, he suggests the etymology first, the word, the word muzzle, is that it's to do with, um, uh, to do with the words um, zol, to do with the words of um, uh, uh, almost energy coming down or, or flow of, of uh, energy. 
And he says that if you believe in astrology or if you're following the astrological model, then you'll talk about mazolus as being the flow of energy that comes through the, the mazolus. But in essence, it means a flow of, of energy, which as a maminim, we would say comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We wish each other mazol tov. Now, now, we don't necessarily mean by that that you should have a good zodiac. We mean that there should be a, a flow of, of, uh, of divine energy. So um, he says the first thing is that you need to, each time you look at the word muzzle, you need to understand the context, actually, what, what it means. Um, that, that's the first point he makes. And the second thing is he, he says is that if you want to put this in Hoshkafic terminology, what we would say is there's certain things which are predetermined, which are part of your core life mission. Um, if, you're, if the essence of the purpose for which you are here on earth is to achieve certain things, then that will be determined, that will be determined in your condition. So if, for example, your unique uh, role in life is to be someone who demonstrates what it is to be wealthy and ethical, then wealth is part of the predetermined context of your existence, which is unchangeable. Great option if that's what if that's what you're lucky enough to have, and which will be unchangeable. And now you have to deal with the challenges of wealth and how you use that morally. If your predetermined path in life is to be an oni and to show how one deals with poverty in, in a moral and ethical way, then that will be fixed and predetermined because that's sort of part of the core mission of, of what you're, you are there for. On the other hand, it may be that you're there for something completely different and wealth and um, poverty don't figure particularly in that life journey, in which case it will solely depend on um, maybe on your struggles or other factors as to how well you will do financially. And it's not something that we should even be looking at muscle to do. In other words, it, it, basically, there are things which are at the core of what we are here to achieve. And these things will be on the, on the context, the stage upon which we are placed out of our control. And now our mission is to deal with them with your Shemaim to the best degree possible and, and uh, make the right choices. And other things are, are beyond, our, uh, beyond our control. And other things are within our control because they're not part of our core life mission. One way in this understanding of understanding Mazel Tov is that you're saying to someone, um, we give you the bracha that your core life mission should be with circumstances that are more pleasant and comfortable to deal with, albeit morally, um, spiritually, just as challenging. So most of us probably would opt to say, I wish to deal with the challenges of wealth rather than challenges of poverty. I wish to deal with the challenges of health rather than challenges of ill health. Um, so we would choose to have the challenges. Now, now, if you are a pure spiritual being, you may recognize that there's no difference between these two options. And uh, both challenges are perhaps equally difficult. But given that we're not, we understand that one challenge is, is, is one that will, will, is, is easier to deal with, one that we prefer to deal with, the only one isn't. And therefore, when you wish someone a muzzle tov, what you're saying is, we hope that your, your fate, your muzzle, in other words, that which is carved out as unique for you, um, the, 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 the divine plan for the tipper, that Hashem, that the Gemara has told us about, in which Hashem looks at this tipper and says, what's going to be its destiny? We hope that that will be something easier to deal with rather than something more difficult to deal with. Basically, this is, this is Rav Desto in his essay, summary of how he collates all these uh, Gemaras. Yeah. What's the difference in definition between astrology and astronomy? Because could you argue that, that I think science says that, say, the yeah. planets affect the weather and things like yes. that. So that if that's astrology at the same time, then you can have it on a sort of on some supranational level, but it might not affect you. It's, it's not an individual thing. So there's no there's no philosophical problem with the idea that star, stars control human fate. Um, you're absolutely right. Look, we, we now live in a world in which we know that um, when I lift this phone and drop it, the exact path in which it drops is influenced by a supernova taking place, you know, 13,000 light years away and, in, in, you know, whatever it is. We, we, we now know that we live in a world in which, uh, you know, the gravitational field in, 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 a, in, a, in a star many, many thousands of light years away from here is influenced just by me lifting up my hand. And we know that the weather is affected by sunspots and the like, and the tides are affected by the mood. moon. There's no philosophical problem with astrology. It, it's a purely scientific question, which is either the position of the stars has an effect on, uh, you know, the development of the DNA, or it doesn't have an effect on the development of the DNA. The, the truth is, it, the truth is, scientifically, we know it does have an effect on the development of DNA. Um, a mutation can occur in my cell because of an alpha particle that was emitted you know, 3,000 years ago from a supernova explaining and exposing, it's been making its way all the way to planet Earth. It makes its way through the atmosphere and the various protections against radiation and strikes a cell at this point in time and causes a mutation. So there's no, there's no philosophical problem with astrology. It's just a scientific question whether, whether, whether it works or not. I don't think any scientist takes it seriously as of 2023 uh, that it has a significant effect on human uh, development. But, but yes or not, it's not, it's not something that we we need to be grounded to. And it's not something that needs to be an ikka hadat. It's not some, a matter of, of central to faith or not. 
Um, we need to acknowledge that there, there appear to be, as the Ramam did, there appear to be Amorim and Tanaim who did believe in it, and there appear to be those who didn't. And, and, and at least the Ramam argues now, go and learn science, don't worry about it as a, as a Jewish or philosophical idea. But the, the core idea, ju just to summarize really what I'm trying to say here is, getting, belaboring the terminology misses the point that, that whether you believe in astrology or not, whatever your, your view around the science of it is, we definitely believe that there are scientific forces at work that have a significant impact on our life. And that there's aspects of our life that are very seriously affected by things beyond our control, whether these are alpha particles coming from outer space, or whether this is our, our DNA or nature of our upbringing and psychological impact of our parents and grandparents on us, or all sorts of things like that. So the core challenge remains, and the best we can say is that some things are beyond our control and are predetermined, and others are, are within our control and we make choices around them. That, 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 it, ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Whether we then label this as pure science, or whether we, again, as part of the Gemara, talk about this as some part of divine plan, the tipa that the Gemara talks about gets us into another discussion, which is a very fascinating one about Ashkach Protis and Ashkach Kolis and the fate of nations, and is there difference? Again, we've spoken about Ashkach Protis and Ashkach Kolis, but they're all missing the core, from a philosophical point of view, they're all missing the core question, which is, are we, do we believe in determinism? Do we believe that everything that occurs to us is predetermined? And the answer is somewhere in the messy middle, some things are predetermined and other things are, are dependent on our choice. And, and, and as I began when we spoke about Nukuda Sabhira, which was Odessa dealing with the psychological effect on our choices, I conclude with Odessa who speaks about the scientific or natural or not, rather than nurture, the nature effects on our choices. And, and really he comes to a, a somewhat analogous conclusion, which is some things are and some things aren't. And, and, and philosophically, this is a very sound place to uh, be. Sorry, I don't know what you want to add to me. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah, so we give a broth of that, yeah. Yeah. So, so it, gets to two, it gets to two questions, really. Number one, what is a bracha and what is tefillah? And the second question is to fill us shov, a uh, steer in the Rambam, whether you can daven think for things which already occurred, but you don't know that they've occurred. So if, if very briefly, you can't daven for something. If, if, uh, if my watch has fallen on the ground and the screen has my clock, my phone, sorry, I've just got it here, so this is the example I'm using, and the screen has smashed, don't daven that the screen shouldn't smash. Um, can you daven for something which has already occurred, but of which we are unaware, Machalikin Sushodim? So it gets down to that, that sort of thing, that maybe Hashem has already decreed the fate of this tipper, but since we don't know it, maybe it makes sense to daven for it, or maybe not, and maybe this is part of the uh, the predetermined plan, maybe not. It's, it's again, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah, there is. There is. But you don't know what's in place, then maybe you can also still daven. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to leave Ainara because it's the same topic. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. Ainara is, is, is an idea that somehow I can influence you through the way I, I perceive you. So that's like human influence. That really gets down to, I can influence you by, I can influence someone else by giving them a gift or by giving them a smack. So I can physically influence people. Now the question is, can I know I also influence people? So that, that's a different discussion. And in, if I want to talk about it in the context of this discussion, we'll get down to what degree can the choices I make affect you. We have unfortunately, uh, sorry, I'm just being asked here two questions online and then I'll stop. The one is, um, given this discussion around inf inf unity and infinity, is it not the case that everything in the world is a manifestation of his choice to restrict himself, cuff Simpson, therefore this applies to your deal. Okay, I, I, I sort of evaded uh, um, terminology of Simpson and so on. Very briefly, the, the, the Mukabalim deal with this issue of hash where is there space for finite existence within the infinity of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the terminology they give to this discussion is Simpson. What exactly Simpson means is, is, is a matter of debate, but, but somehow or other we exist as material finite beings in an infinite universe and in that sense Bechira and Yadiyah is part of that discussion that God has an infinite knowledge and yet we still have space for Bechira. Um, I did once, I think I, I once spoke around uh, the, these issues, if not then, then that can be a topic for another another share. And the next thing I'm being asked to just very briefly is um, uh, concept of Bashat. Okay, I, I, all I'm going to say around the word Bashat is, is referencing the Gemara in Saita of Beis Amadal, that I mentioned about Zivik Rish and Zivik Shani. The Gemara seems to be saying, it, again, a significant machlokes to Shani about what exactly the Gemara means, but the Gemara seems to be saying that um, uh, in principle, a life partner might be predetermined, but in practice, it can be influenced by the choices we make and how exactly you resolve that um, going on the Gemara there with the Shani. Okay, we've run out of time, so we'll stop here for today. And um, it's Hashem. We'll start next week in new topics. I'm open for uh, I'm open for nominations around the new uh, the, the new subject. I'm sorry I rushed a little bit, but I, I've been saying for four weeks this will be the last year on the subject. So I'm absolutely determined that this week should be the last uh, the last year on this uh, on this topic. And I wish everyone a good day. Thanks for joining. Thank you.